Good day, everyone, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the All Things Chronic, Graft versus Host Disease, including expert advice and a patient experience conference call, hosted by the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer Gillette. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you so much, Hannah. Yes, my name is Jennifer Gillette, and I am the staff social worker at the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link. I'd like to welcome you to our Lunch and Learn with the Link. This month's program will focus on all things chronic graft versus host disease uh, with both a professional and a survivor perspective. A special thank you to our sponsors, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Insight Corporation, Pharmacyclics and Janssen, and our esteemed link partners for making this program possible today. I also want to thank all of you for the overwhelming response of questions we received. We know how many of you are desperate for answers, and we're so thankful to have our speakers here today to hopefully help you find tips, next steps, and um, perhaps some solutions as you try to navigate this complex disease. If your question is not answered directly today, our doctor has agreed to respond to each question individually and I will respond for her. So I will take the collection of questions we have, send it to her, she'll answer it, and I will respond. Um, if you have not pre-submitted a question or you do not get your question answered today, you're welcome to contact me through our website, and I will work on that for you. However, please keep in mind this will probably take some time as we did receive an overwhelming amount of questions, but we're going to do our best to get to every single one. And thank you, Dr. M., of course, for doing this. Um, just so everyone knows, a brief outline for today, we're just going to spend a couple minutes um, talking about the link, just in case anyone is not familiar with our organization. And then I'm going to hand it over to our speaker, Dr. Annie M., for about 20 to 25 minutes, and she's going to try to get to some of the questions that were pre-submitted. And then we have survivor Meredith Cowden, who will speak for a few moments. And then we're going to open floor to your questions. Um, so to begin, for those who are not familiar with the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, we are dedicated to helping individuals and their families from diagnosis through survivorship. We provide resources, support, and education. Some of the resources we provide to help families navigate their transplant journey are our webinars, podcasts, blogs, our lunch and learn calls like you're on today, for things such as chronic graft-versus-host disease, disease-specific information, or topics on caregiving, coping, treatment options, and survivorship. We also have our peer support mentor program for patients, caregivers, and donors, our second birthdays recognition program. We also have several books and referrals, and we provide emotional support from a licensed social worker. So please feel free to reach out to us if you're interested in any of these services. Before we begin today's program, I would also like to review a few housekeeping items to maximize the experience for all on the call. Please be mindful in being concise with your questions so that we may answer as many as possible. Also, please know that the information provided in this program is meant to stimulate conversation with your own healthcare provider and is not meant to replace your individualized medical plan. So now, on to the educational part of our program. We are so very thankful to have Dr. Annie M. back with us. She is just a treasure to the link and a wealth of information. Dr. Annie M. is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology Oncology at the University of Pittsburgh Hillman Cancer Center. She has been on faculty since completing her fellowship there in July 2013. Annie has been heavily involved in medical education for residents and fellows, and as a clinical researcher, she has been involved in the development of clinical trials targeting novel mechanisms in the treatment of acute myeloid leukemia and chronic graft-versus-host disease. Annie also has a close collaboration with the Chronic Graft-versus-Host Disease Research Group in the Experimental Transplantation and Immunology Branch at the National Cancer Institute, led by Dr. Stephen Pavletic. Her clinical interests also include the development of a chronic graft-versus-host disease and long-term follow-up program for the stem cell transplant program at UPMC. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. M. Thank 
you, Jennifer. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, who's joined the call today. Um, I appreciate you giving your time. Um, and I also really appreciate all of the, the pre-submitted questions. I think that's really helpful for us to, to know how uh, best to focus this, this talk. Um, I thought it would be best to just talk a little bit about some of the themes that we saw in the questions and try to capture as many um, of the questions as possible with that. Um, and then, uh, as Jennifer said afterwards, we'll leave some time for, for additional questions that weren't answered. Um, I also want to thank Meredith Cowden for joining us because I think it's so important to have um, the patient perspective, um, somebody who's been such an inspiration to so many people um, and, and really can provide information that I cannot. So I think it's, it's going to be a, a wonderful a talk. Um, I guess to start off, um, and, th and again, I think there were some really great questions submitted and a lot of them, so um, I, I, of varying topics. So I'll kind of um, jump around, but again, try to cover as much as I, I, I think uh, were common things. Um, as a sort of an introduction, I will just say that um, a reminder about the treatment of, of chronic graft versus host disease, um, that there is, uh, on the one hand, the systemic treatments that we give to try to target the mm -hmm. immune system and the whole process of, of what the immune system is doing. Um, in addition to that, there's also organ-specific or organ-directed treatments, which are different. They may not necessarily change the disease process or change the course of a chronic graft versus host disease, but they are extremely helpful and um, uh, things that we use very often for symptomatic relief for some of the specific organ um, symptoms and, and complications. And so um, they are sort of two different categories and two different purposes, but, you know, we use them hand in hand. Um, I think especially since, you know, sometimes our, our systemic treatments uh, may not be as helpful in treating the, the specific organ symptoms, that's where our organ-specific um, treatments are, are really helpful. So um, the first topic I wanted to address, uh, because I saw this coming up in, a, in several questions, was this idea of whether or not graft-versus-host disease will be a concern that it would be around forever. You know, does it ever go away? Is it something that, that, that um, you will always have to be concerned about? And so, um, you know, I, I wanted to, to reassure people that graft-versus-host disease is something that will eventually, the whole disease process is something that will eventually end. Um, you know, it's this idea, we call it a quote-unquote burnout of the process because eventually the immune system figures out its tolerance and, and it will get there. How long that takes? Um, especially in any given individual person is is unpredictable and, and we don't know that answer. Um, it could be on, on a range of years for people, but um, at least I wanted to provide the reassurance that this is a process that will end. Um, and that is why, uh, you know, we are able, most people who are on some form of immunosuppression for chronic graft versus host disease are able to come off at some point. And not everyone. Some people, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a percentage of people who will stay on um, some amount of immunosuppression, low level, long term for many years, but, um, you know, most people are able to eventually come off. Um, so I wanted to first, you know, let you know about that. The other, another question that I saw come up um, fairly often was, you know, is does this happen to everyone? And it doesn't necessarily happen to everyone. Um, it is a it is a common um, late complication of transplant. Um, and again, just the reassurance that it does that it does end. Um, I saw also, um, and I guess one other thing that I will mention is I, I did see some questions that, um, you know, sounded quite frustrated um, with, you know, feeling like, is this ever going to end for me, um, you know, particular, uh, you know, just feeling very um, burdened by, by the symptoms. And so, um, you know, I really, um, you know, I, I – my – my sympathies go out to you guys. I, I think that I've, I've seen and, and had journeys with lots of patients who have gone through lots of very different kinds of symptoms with chronic graft versus host disease, um, and I, I have seen how how what a, what a toll that can take on people, and um, in particular with quality of life, um, their day to day functioning. 
um, and that can really, you know, cause a lot of anxiety for people, even depression. And so um, the other, I guess, big message that I want to give people is that there is a lot of hope. And I think that's, again, as I, I was saying before, I think that's it's so great that Meredith is with us to to really provide a real example of that hope. Um, you know, as I said, this should end. There's lots of great treatments that are not only currently available but coming down the line, which I will talk a little bit about. Um, lots of things on the horizon. There's a lot of research going into this area right now, a lot of interest in from companies in, in putting, investing time and money into this this research. Um, so there is a lot of hope, and I, I, and I don't want people to – um, lose sight of that hope um, to feel like it's it is hopeless. You know, as, as there's so much great activity going on, so many great therapies that you know it can take a long time. And I think that's what's sometimes hard to to get patients through is that it's it's a, it's a long process. It's not something that's going to end tomorrow. It's not something that we can necessarily make people um, feel better immediately with. But it's it's something that you know there is a lot of hope for. Um, Another thing that people asked a lot about were some organ-specific complications, treatment options, things like that. So I'll talk a little bit about that, but I do also want to leave some time for um, some new systemic drugs that are that are coming down the line. Um, a lot of folks had asked about uh, lungs, um, chronic GVHD of the lungs. So um, that is a really a particularly challenging area um, because, with a, as with some of the other complications with GVHD. When the damage is done, oftentimes it, that, that it's hard to reverse. So a lot of our goals of treatment are to prevent any further worsening, but sometimes it can be hard to reverse what's been done, and in particular, I will say that's for the lungs. Um, that being said, we still have a lot of treatments for lungs and other areas that are, have more sort of irreversible damage in at least making people feel better. So, you know, trying to improve quality of life and the symptoms and things like that. Um, for the and, and for many years, treatment of the lungs has been challenging. But actually, we have a couple of lung-specific treatments that are now available, or at least being studied. Um, one thing are, are, are um, treatments that we actually use in other lung diseases, and it's a regimen, a three-drug regimen called SAM, um, and that stands for fluticasone, azithromycin, and montelukast. And what that basically is is an inhaled steroid, an antibiotic called azithromycin, which is actually used for its anti-inflammatory um, uh, effects, and montelukast, which is singular, which is also used as an anti-inflammatory for the lungs, and it's used in other um other types of uh, lung diseases. So um, that is something that has been studied specifically in lung chronic GVHD after um, stem cell transplant and has been shown to be effective. Um, and that's a fairly easy regimen to, to take, to use, and so that's that's a, um, definitely something that we recommend for lungs. Another thing is um, something that's being studied right now, and actually I was involved uh, a little bit with this with um, Dr. Pavletic at the NIH, um, we looked at a, a drug, it's a pill, that is something called a neutrophil elastase inhibitor, and that's basically a fancy word for uh, another anti-inflammatory mechanism. So it's sort of um, halting the the damaging effects that um, the typical inflammatory uh, response um, can have when it sort of goes overboard. And so um, that, you know, we've studied that um, in a handful of patients that's, you know, been shown to be helpful in, in improving how people feel um, and even potentially, um, you know, maybe some improvement in um, pulmonary function tests, but certainly in, in we, we've seen that it's been helpful in, in stabilizing that. Um, so things like that are, are, are organ-specific treatments that are coming down the line. Um, I did see somebody mention a question about lung transplant, um, and again, because the, the effects of chronic GVHD can be irreversible sometimes in the lungs, if it gets progressive enough, um, at some point we do recommend a lung transplant or an organ transplant. Um, we have done that a handful of times here, um, and, it, and also I know that they actually published uh, an experience with this out at um, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle. Um, and you know, across the board, um, it's been fairly successful um, in treating severe lung GVHD. Um, so definitely an option for people who are able to undergo a lung transplant as well. Um, I'm going to 
move on to other organs. So um, uh, there's also a lot of questions about the eyes. I will say that the eyes are, are one organ in particular where the organ-specific therapy is so important um, because the systemic therapies aren't as helpful, especially for the symptomatic piece, um, usually. Um, and the other thing is it's it's really nice because ophthalmologists have so many tools that they can use to be able to do organ-specific treatments for the for um, chronic GVHD of the eyes. Um, so there are things like um, so drops, eye drops that can be made out of your own blood, um, the the fluid of your blood actually, um, that actually helps hydrate your eyes a little bit a little bit longer. Um, there are things like uh, trying to maintain hydration that's in the eyes by blocking the, the tear ducts. Um, there are special specialized lenses that are supposed to be hydrating for the eyes um, that are called scleral lenses that are that you know anecdotally I have seen such incredible um, results from this um, really it has helped people a lot um, and there's other things that are fairly again fairly um, easy to do like even like hydrating goggles again the whole idea of just trying to keep moisture in the eyes somehow um, and so lots of specific things there's also um, you know Fortunately, some research going on in this area as well, and so there's clinical trials at various places looking at specialized eye drops, different treatments um, for chronic GVHD of the eye. So I do recommend for sure seeing an ophthalmologist, especially one, you know, ideally one who has had experience with GVHD, although that's not always possible. But nonetheless, these all of these treatments are things that um, uh, an ophthalmologist should be able to do. Um, so definitely recommend that. Um, in terms of other areas uh, that I saw a lot of questions about, one was the mouth. Um, that also has a lot of great organ-specific treatments. So um, things like, um, in, in this, a lot of you may have already heard of these things, but you know, oral steroid solutions that you can use as rinses, um, even um, topical or you know um, creams or um, liquids that include things like tacrolimus or other immunosuppressants. Um, there's a, it's a little bit different when it's the mouth inside versus the lips, and so the tr treatments can be a little bit different. But things like um, even injections of steroids can be helpful for um, some areas like ulcers or things on the lips and areas like that that are affected. So lots of different topical treatments that can be done. Um, a, uh, another thing that's actually being, you know, we're participating in a, in a trial that should be opening hopefully very soon for this is something called low-level laser therapy. Um, it's actually just very, as it sounds, very low-level of a laser that is used, um, that is just, that is put directly right on the mouth and the, the tissue of the mouth. Um, so it has basically zero side effects but can be very helpful in just helping that that the tissue in that in those areas heal um, and we've seen a lot of really great effects with that as well that helps with um, uh, they actually use that a lot even for um, mucositis with chemotherapy so for prevention or treatment of that so um, not surprisingly it's also helpful in chronic GBHD as well and um, hopefully we should be getting some good data um, from from this upcoming study so um, Lots of great uh, treatments. And then another thing to think about for the mouth as well is that in addition to chronic GBHD, something, something that can sometimes um, be another cause of similar symptoms but is obviously treated very differently are infections. And so something that's something that you, you just don't want to forget about, that sometimes if you're treating you know, some painful lesions that really aren't getting better and if anything getting worse with some of the treatments for GVHD, you know, you always want to be thinking about is could this potentially also be an, an infection, a viral infection in the mouth, something like that. So um, just always have that in the back of your mind as well because that's something that's very treatable also. Um, I, I will just briefly mention also musculoskeletal and the sclerotic effects. This can be, oh gosh, such a such an terribly, um, uh, you know, a difficult symptom to deal with um, in terms of being able to do your normal uh, everyday activities. Um, and so this is an area that um, systemic treatments are helpful, but in terms of some additional things that you can do, I think just being proactive about physical therapy and stretches is really so important and to really be very proactive and, and aggressive about it um, because that really does make a difference. Um, you know, deep tissue massages and things like that are also really helpful. Um, but, you know, I think the activity and making sure to not, um, you know, let things get worse by inactivity is really important. 
Um, but as I said, I do think that this is an area that is it is um, sensitive to the systemic therapies. So I will talk um, just briefly about that as well. So um, I think some folks have been asking about sort of what's new on the horizon, what are some options for treatment of GBHD. And, you know, I will tell you, I'm sure I will tell you some things that you already know about um, because, you know, there's, as, as you may or may not know, um, there is no kind of standard treatment for uh, what, you know, for chronic GBHD once you get past steroids. So steroids are the best first option um, that, and, you know, so far, nothing has proven to be better than steroids for at least the initial treatment, um, but sort of going beyond steroids, what to use once, you know, in, to be able to, A, get off the steroids, or if steroids aren't working, or if GVHD comes back um, after steroids, any of those things, um, there is no standard you know, next line treatment. And so it really depends on, um, you know, what institution you're at, physician preference, your, you know, your particular symptoms and manifestations. You know, there are some drugs that might be better for certain areas than others, you know, what you've already had, what side effects they might have. So um, that's why some of you may be familiar with some drugs and others are not and et cetera. So there's really a wide range. Um, but, you know, some of the, the, um, Ones that you're probably more familiar with are things like um, tacrolimus, cyclosporin, Celsept, serolimus, some of these older drugs. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about some of the things that are coming down the line that are really promising, really exciting. And I think, um, you know, the reason for that is because, first of all, they're more targeted. So they're, they're these drugs that we're using for other areas in oncology or even other areas in um, autoimmune diseases that are very specific um, in, in their mechanism. Um, so it helps with side effects. But because they're so specific in their mechanism also, they're very effective. And so I think both, um, both uh, you know, because of these are such uh, advanced drugs, um, we're seeing less side effects but also a lot more efficacy, which is such a great combination. Um, one drug that has been around a little while now, um, so you may have heard of it, um, one class of drugs is called JAK inhibitors or J-A-K. And um, some of these drugs are used in myelofibrosis, um, a, a blood disease, and some are used in autoimmune diseases. Um, and it, the way that these work are basically it's an, uh, a very um, effective and specific anti-inflammatory drug, um, and it stops this inflammatory process that's set off by different um, markers in, in the blood that, that tell the immune system to kind of go. Um, so it halts that process. Um, and different JAK inhibitors, what we call, is what we call them. Different JAK inhibitors have different um, profiles in terms of what they target and different side effect profiles. But in general, you know, we've seen a lot of promise with these drugs. There's one in particular called Jacafi or Ruxolitinib that is actually FDA approved for treatment of acute graft versus host disease. Um, and it's also, uh, we've seen a lot, you know, there's been a lot of experience with it in chronic graft versus host disease. Um, it's just not FDA approved. Um, but there's also um, one called baricitinib that we're looking at um, and also idacitinib. So lots of different kinds of JAK inhibitors is, is the big category. Um, really promising for, for both acute and chronic graft versus host disease. Um, and there's actually, um, even though this was FDA approved fairly early, there was a very big sort of confirmation study in the New England Journal of Medicine that um, showed that that Ruxolid or Jacophy for acute graft versus host disease really is much better than anything else that we have um, for treating acute graft versus host disease that comes back after steroids or doesn't respond to steroids. So really exciting. There's another um, uh Drug and its its um, its name is actually it's not doesn't have it, it does have an official name but it's, it's most commonly reported as KD025 um, and its mechanism is that it's a ROC2 inhibitor like ROCK2 um, basically what that means is also a form of uh, suppressing the immune system very specifically um, and there's some thought that while it suppresses the immune system it actually doesn't suppress um, the some of the, the T cells that are important in sort of preventing or treating um, graft versus host disease. So, again, sort of more specific effects as opposed to just kind of um, globally suppressing all T cells. So um, that is uh, – there have been some really promising res results in that. Um, 
they have seen responses really in all organs, and I should say that also for the JAK inhibitors, that it's not that it's just for certain areas. You know, some people think that skin GVHD is a little easier to treat, and some studies have only really looked at that as, as an endpoint, but really for these all of these drugs that I'm mentioning, they've seen responses across all different organs, including the lungs. Um, although again, again, that's a, that's a harder organ to treat, but you know we've seen some good responses, and um, you know overall, in, in people who have taken this drug, and in, and the setting is that again, as with all of these studies, it's it's almost always after the use of steroids, um, they uh, seen response rates in this high sixty percent, which is really high for um, a second line line drug for chronic GVHD, so really promising. Um, and uh likely will be fully FDA approved for this um for this um indication pretty soon. Um other things um that are being other kind of classes of drugs, you know, some drugs that are used as uh what we call B cell inhibitors um or targeting B cells and that this is a really common class of drugs for treating some cancers, um, including some hematologic can- blood cancers like lymphomas and leukemias. Um, but they're because of the way that they work and they inhibit B cells, and B cells are not only involved in those types of cancers, but they're also involved in um, in the disease process for GVHD. Uh, there has been some really um, uh, promising results in looking at those types of drugs for GVHD as well. Um, and you know the list goes on and on in terms of different t- types of immune modulating a- drugs, things that you know sort of modulate the immune system, not just sort of suppress it globally, as I said before. Um, Also, different kinds of cellular therapies that are being looked at. So, really, there's so much activity uh, in this. Um, I do encourage people, when possible, to try to look for clinical trials. That really, I think, is the best best option um, for people who have chronic GBHD because, you know, you, you know, with so much activity going on and because there's no standard of care in terms of what's, what to use after steroids, you know, getting an opportunity to be on one of these trials and I think is a, is a, is a great thing. And they're not available everywhere, but, you know, if it is an option for you, certainly it's something to ask your doctor about. Um, I think that would be very important. There's also, um, uh, and Meredith can, can tell you probably a little bit about her experience with this, but um, at the NIH or the uh, National Institutes of Health, um, you know, I mentioned Dr. Steve Pavletic. He runs a, a chronic GVHD program there where he will see um, people uh, for, eval- for really comprehensive evaluations, um, not just by him, but by all sorts of different subspecialists and experts who have a lot of experience with graft versus host disease, and they come up with a, a consensus of, of recommendations um, and also potentially cl- clinical trial options, and so that's uh, that's something to think about. But again, it's it's worth asking your doctor about, you know, are there any clinical trial options for me for, for graft versus host disease? Um, when I looked, I think it was just today, this morning, I, I just quickly looked to see how many trials were available for chronic graft versus host disease on our, um, it's called clinicaltrials.gov, um, something that um, patients can access as well. So if that's something, uh, so it's a, it's a good um, resource for what clinical trials are available. If you just look up chronic graft versus host disease, I think there were almost 50 that were, in terms of ones that were actively, uh, that were open and actively uh, recruiting patients right now. Um, not all of those are direct treatment trials, so I'd say maybe about half of those are treatment trials, but even that is really incredible, especially compared to um, there used to be, you know, very few. So um, really, you know, a great option. Um, I'll also um, briefly mention uh, some. there were some questions um, about COVID, not surprisingly, given the, the, the time that we're in right now. Um, and... You know, honestly, we haven't seen, fortunately, have not seen a lot of COVID in in stem cell transplantations as of yet. Um, There was actually, back earlier during when when this started, there was some experience from Europe, a report from Europe about, um, you know, I think it was about 15 patients who had developed COVID after a stem cell transplant. Um, One of them had passed away, but uh, there was still, it was still sort of early in terms of, you know, what kind of impact this was going to have long term. Um, but that was just the, the only kind of report that I've seen. Um, otherwise, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, I think the same precautions still apply. I mean, you know, I think 
I guess, uh, you know, one, one silver lining is that stem cell transplant patients, and all of you are, are very familiar with how to be very careful and cautious about infections and viruses, and so it's all of those same precautions, obviously. Um, and, um, you know, there's there's some recommendations about you know what we how we consider you know what what our considerations are pre-transplant, um, testing the donor, testing the patient by, prior to transplant, things like that. Um, but as I said, there fortunately has not been a lot of um, COVID in, in transplant patients yet, and I and I hope it stays that way. Um, an additional thing that I will mention as sort of an aside, not not specific to organs, but I know that someone had mentioned, um, you know, fatigue. Um, and I will say that that is unfortunately a common uh, and a challenging symptom in terms of treatment. Um, it is very common and obviously, as you know, can really impact, you know, day-to-day -day and your quality of life. Um, and unfortunately, we just don't have great treatments for it. Um, but, you know, anecdotally, in my experience, I think things that have been really helpful are, um, some of these, you know, alternative, you know, things that are not medicine, so things that are um, just kind of light exercise that's tolerable, physical therapy, um, yoga, um, all of the kind of complementary medicines. You know, I, I've had patients do all sorts of things in terms of trying to help with um, symptoms like this. Um, even, you know, essential oils, things like that. And, and so, you know, things, you know, it's always important to ask your doctor about things, but I think that things that are... Um, Sort of what we what we call complementary medicine, things that are not actually drugs, but things that might help um, with things like this, actually have been really helpful. Um, and I guess uh, I'm, I'm just looking at the time. I don't want to take up too much time because I want to make sure we have enough time um, for additional questions as well as Meredith. So um, I will stop there. I will. Um, I'll stop there, and then um, we'll see if additional questions come up. And um, I love to turn it over to uh, to Meredith. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. M. That was a great overview and uh, summary of some of those questions. Uh, and yes, Meredith Cowden is going to be our next speaker. She's a licensed professional clinical counselor who graduated from the Cleveland Institute of Art with a bachelor's degree in fine arts and Ursuline College with a master's degree in art therapy and counseling. She is an AML survivor and had a transplant back in 2011. After her transplant began, um, she began another, or after her transplant, I'm sorry, she started another journey trying to manage a new disease, chronic graft versus host disease. She and her family have developed a foundation to help others be educated and supported as they try to navigate this difficult disease. So yes, thank you so much for joining us, Meredith. Hi. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate this, and I, I think this is, you know, such a wonderful opportunity for, you know, everybody who's listening, and, and you know, as well as, you know, people who can listen in the future. And thanks to Annie M. It's, you know, she's amazing, and wonderful, and and I think, you know, you explained a lot of things really, really well. Um. So one of the, so there are a few things that I want to talk about, and I do. I'll, I promise I'll be as brief as I can. Um. But, uh, so yeah, so in, it was actually in 2001 I had my transplant. I had a bone marrow transplant. My sister was my donor. It was a perfect match. Um, and then in 2002, that's when I started to develop graft for supposed to be. I stopped, well, I guess I've had it consistently over the last 18 years or so. Um, and so it's, it's been kind of up and down. And so there are some things that I want to talk about as far as, you know, di the different experience that I've had with it and the different forms that it's taken on and all of the different things that I've tried that my family has tried as management techniques and just basis of you know, creating life and, and continuing to live with it. That's one of the things that go on. I am so sorry, quick. Meredith, to interrupt you, but you're oh, breaking up a little bit. Is there any way you can maybe um, move around a little bit? I'm so sorry, but you no, just were a little no, no, crunchy no, no. there. <laughs> okay. Is this, is it getting – tell me when it's getting oh, better. It sounds and then better. I can, it sounds better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Just, just let sorry. me know again. Go ahead. I'll no, let no, you know let if me it's know a problem. Me. Okay. Thanks. Good. Um, so, yeah, so back in, let's see, so initially in 2002 when I started to get the symptoms 
of chronic graft or supposed to be that manifested primarily in my on my skin and in my gut and my intestinal tract. And so that's when I was put on high doses of steroids. And I also went through a bunch of different things. I tried, I think, mycophenolate, um, and I tried a whole bunch of different drugs, and I can't remember all of them right now. But um, so then things kind of got a bit better managed. It was under control. And then in around, what, 2006-ish is when I started to develop um, graft versus host disease in a different form, which is it, which is talked about a bit in some of these questions. I developed uh, polymyositis that um, basically was either part of GVHD or as a result of GVHD, and I think that's probably been one of the more problematic issues that I've had over the last years. Um, so then, back up on steroids. I tried. Let's say I've tried a whole bunch of. We're losing you again, Meredith. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Don't don't you apologize. Let me see. Um, <laughs> is, t- tell me when it's better. Oh, it better? You know, I hear you now. It's these cell phones. Sometimes they get a little uh, touchy. But anyway, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> okay. Is this okay? Uh, yeah. So far, so good. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so basically, some of the things that I wanted to talk about, as far as the um, the management of it, is is that you know, with graft versus host disease, oftentimes, from my from my point of view, it's important to keep track of what are your symptoms, what are the things that seem to be triggering your symptoms, because the way that the polymyositis began is that it actually developed because of sunlight. So I, I had, I got on vacation, I think to the, like somewhere in Florida, and then I, I developed hypercalcemia and then I developed polymyositis. And it took quite a bit of time to figure that out. And so, um, so knowing that and then knowing that the sun is, is one of the things that triggers my GVHD. And I imagine that it, it could be different for everyone. I'm not sure if I think somebody mentioned the sun in in a question, and then that can have a large impact. Um, in back in 2008, I did go to the NIH as part of their history of, of chronic graft versus host disease study, which is a phenomenal longitudinal study, and it it basically follows you. So they they did a whole lot of different assessments, and then like Annie said, gave uh, recommendations for me as far as you know what I should look into and what kinds of treatment protocols. Um, so some of the things that I think are beneficial and helpful for people to know and just different things that, that I've tried um, as far as management of this goes is I think that, it, you know, going along with the, the musculoskeletal and stuff and also skin is that it's so, so important to take good care of your skin, not just because of, you know, the sun and all of that kind of stuff, but also because if you're taking steroids for a long time, that has an effect on your skin and it can stretch it and make it very thin. And so um, one of the things that I found is that there are different motions that help protect it. And it's funny enough that actually one of them is for cow udders. Sounds silly, but it works really well. There's utterly smooth. That's one of them. Um, Bag balm is more of like a, um, oh, what am I thinking of? Uh, Vaseline type thing that works well for your lips if your lips tend to peel a lot. Um, and then generally CeraVe is something that um, one of the dermatologists at the um, NIH recommended to me and that I find to be not irritating. It's really soothing. It's very calming to my skin. So I use a lot of CeraVe products. And I know the doctor recommended that as probably the best sunscreen that you could use, which is hugely important. There are also different things that you can put into um, – your laundry, like there are different things that put sunscreen into your clothes, so you don't have to necessarily buy clothes that that specifically protect your skin. Because I know sometimes people have had to do that. So that's something. Going along with what Annie was saying, I think that um, movement and stretching is is paramount. It's super super important because you lose muscle and you lose muscle mass, and so. 
So then, and also then joints and everything kind of tightens up. And so, you know, continuing to do stretches, I've done physical therapy, getting those bands, those stretchy bands in like a balance ball. It's also incredibly helpful in just doing whatever it is that you can. Um, hydrotherapy, you know, aquatic therapy is, is excellent if you, if you can get someone to give you a prescription for that, which I think couldn't be too terribly tricky. Um, that's also very helpful because it doesn't have the, the weight. Um, because one of the other things that happens is, you know, it's, it's very impactful on your joints. One of the things that I've developed is avascular necrosis. And so my, my joints and my bones are not the strongest. And so I can't do a whole lot of weight bearing activity. So I need to do things that are lower impact. So stretching, hydrotherapy, um, I do do yoga and Pilates, but I have, um, I have a different like blocks and things to help uh, modify it, I guess is the right word, and so and manage it so that it's not so challenging. Also, there are days that I've just done the chair yoga. That's also very helpful. Um, as far as, you know, some, one of the things that Annie mentioned that I think is really important is the fatigue, and I think that's probably been one of the, the biggest challenges over the last years that, that I've dealt with, and there are different things that, that I've tried. Um, I met with a palliative care doctor, and he recommended a ginseng supplement. And there's a specific one. I think it's Wisconsin, and you're you're supposed to take. Ideally, typically you're supposed to take four of them. He told me to take eight. I, I find that it does help a bit. Um, and then also the other thing is I don't know how many people are familiar with the concept of um, the the spoon theory. It's based upon a young woman who had developed lupus. And she's trying to explain to her friend how she manages her time and her energy. And so she uses it based off of this idea of, I have this many spoons today. So spoons are based on, you know, physical ability, mental ability, and just, you know, overall mood. And so if you start out with this many spoons, kind of figuring out how many spoons each activity or each thing is going to take and when you need to stop or take a break because the, the energy management and the time management is, is very, very important. So then you don't get burnt out and spend a lot of time, you know, not being able to do things that you would like to do. Um, some of the things that also I tried and then I didn't want to check on the time and see where we're okay. Um, is that for, and it depends on your mouth and how, like, how well things are with your mouth if it gets inflamed very easily. But, you know, with the um, uh, prednisone for myself, you know, I have, along with the dry eyes, I have a dry mouth. And so I oftentimes have mints around. And, and also I, I like those little ginger chews because they're good for my mouth, but they're also really good for my belly and my stomach when I'm feeling nauseous or upset. So I tend to carry those around with me. They're not the greatest for your teeth, so you just have to be careful with how many of those you, you, you know, take at a time. Um, but they're, they're good for, you know, just so that you don't necessarily get like a super, super dry mouth. And then also for managing nausea and um, that kind of stuff. Going along with that, as far as foods, some of the things, the diets that have seemed to work the best are mostly like the the DASH diet or um, kind of going along with sort of a diabetic diet because that's additionally something that can happen if you're taking steroids for a long time, you can develop diabetes. And so just making sure that you eat fully balanced meals. Um, I've met with a nutritionist before and I found that to be very, very helpful in suggestions and ideas of different things to eat. Um, and then overall, just like a Mediterranean diet is, is good, you know, with all of that. I do take a lot of supplements um, just to help with management of, well, to maintain, you know, vitamins and minerals and all of that. But also I take turmeric to help with joint pain, which I have found that that does, from my perspective, it does seem to help me. Um, I take that and then, you know, the basic, what, do I, what else do I take? Basic things like I take vitamin D, but a limited amount because of the sun and then CoQ10, um, there's fish oil, black seed, all of those kinds of things. Um, and then a couple other things, and then I promise I'll stop talking, um, 
is that I think it's really, really, really important to pay attention to your mental well-being in this whole process because it is so up and down. And so, you know, it's very, very common for people with graft versus host disease to develop anxiety and depression. And so seeing a therapist, talking to somebody, perhaps considering taking some kind of medication to help, but as well as that, you know, engaging in things that are meaningful for you, like meaningful activities. I, you know, oftentimes talk to people about finding the thing that, that um, energizes you and energizes your soul. So not that you can, like, you know, walk around with energy, but more energizes your soul and your being just so that you feel that sense of fulfillment and meaning in life. Um, and so addressing that, spending time with people that you care about in a safe way, especially right now with everything that's going on. Um, and then the one last thing that I think is, that I mentioned earlier that I want to emphasize is this idea of keeping track of your symptoms, your medication that you're taking, what you're eating, what you're doing, how you're feeling, because you'll be able to notice trends and you'll be able to see you know, what's working and what's not and what could potentially be, be a trigger for you and kind of cause a flare-up. Um, and so also things to notice as to, like, for instance, when you're running out of spoons. So this activity reduces the spoons. So then maybe managing and spacing things out in that manner. Um, and I think I'm going to stop there. I feel like that's a lot. And that leaves <laughs> a little bit of time for questions. So thank well, you. Well, I... You, I wish we had three hours for this because I, even though you and Dr. Annie did a great job getting as much information as possible in a very short amount of time. So thank you both. Um, we are going to probably go a little over the hour. Um, as a reminder, if your question is not answered today, you may reach out to me by going on our website at mbmtlink.org and sending it to me, and we will get a response to you. So if you do not get what you're looking for today, please reach out to us. But on that note, um, let's try to see if we can get some more questions in. Uh, Hannah, can you please tell uh, the callers how they can ask a question? Yes, thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star, followed by the one on your telephone keypad. Also, if you are using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. A voice prompt on the phone line will indicate when your line is open. You may state your name before posing your question. Once again, that is star one. We do have a few questions in queue. We'll go to our first question. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, this is Nancy. I am a survivor of ALL with the Philadelphia chromosome, I had a bone marrow transplant, then I had a seizure, I went into a coma for 90 days. When I came back out, I'd lost pretty much all my memory. Um, this is going on two and a half years ago. So I'm back. Um, I guess my question has to do with GBHD in terms of my eyes. I've done the punctal plugs. I've done the um, autologous serum drops from my own blood. I've done every drop. Uh, nobody seems to be able to figure it out. Then there was a study from Ocugen, um, which was supposed to come out and then was canceled. So I'm just curious if there's any advice about the eye issue in terms of um, how the uh, ALL has affected me and any kind of hopeful stuff that I can reach out to. Sure. Thank you for your question. Um, I'm sorry that the, the clinical trial wasn't available because I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the exact um, drug that, or treatment that they're looking at in that trial, but I think I've heard of it and have had, I've heard some, uh, anecdotally heard had some, some good experiences. Um, yeah, my, you know, uh, one of my, I have Sorry, one of my ophthalmologists, there's six, said he was, you know, that was like the best move for me. And then he called like two months later to say, I guess there wasn't enough patients or, but that it was canceled. So I was super, super disappointed. Yeah. Um, you know, have, there's also, um, I had mentioned this earlier, um, sometimes the option of scleral lenses. 
Um, they used to be called feral lenses. Yeah, um, that um, that's something that only certain ophthalmologists um, can do. But um, if there's somebody in the area, I did those. Oh, you I did, did the scleral okay. lenses, yeah, and they they helped for a few months and then bad again. Oh, and I did wow. the pros lenses as well. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, I think <laughs> the only, um, you, and and it's not you know, and I'll tell you, it's not uncommon that we see this that that people kind of try therapy after therapy that may give some brief relief, but, you know, unfortunately, um, sometimes, you know, there's no, it's hard to find something that gives long-term relief. You know, the only other, I guess, category of things that, uh, and tell me if you've tried this or not, um, are, you know, actual systemic drugs that help um, sort of create more, um, you know, sort of more, more tears. Um, although uh, the, the yeah, what are those? those- the problem with those is they they kind of, they can um, um, give you uh, you know other kinds of side effects. There's things like something called pilocarpine is one of them. Um, they're they're basically things that like make make more can can potentially make more fluid, right? So like a tear. Oh, and, I don't and know saliva. pilocarpine. I just got. Um, but like I said, they they can come with other side effects. But you know that's I, oh. I would say that that some of the oral drugs. Are one are the only thing that um, it sounds like you haven't tried. Sometimes uh, haven't. ophthalmologists will use doxycycline, which is an antibiotic. To um, there's there's some mechanism by that, that sort of helps with um, opening. Yeah, up we glands. did the doxy. We did the doxy. Okay. He took me yeah. off. I've never heard of the pilocarpine. Is that oral or is that eye drop? Yeah, that's a pill. Um, there's another one oh, called. Okay. Um, I think it's like civalamine, civimaline. It's a, it's another related drug in that class. There's two of them, but um, so that's that's a potentially an option. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's again, I would say that's that's probably aside from some of the things that um, you know the 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 goggles and band, bands that kind of help you know hydrate the eyes. Although those are the problem with those is that that's you know that only that that thing has limited. Benefit with um, it, it does require you to to wear these things, and that that can sometimes be hard. Yeah, and I got I got the goggles, and I I, I look great with the motorcycle glasses. I got the <laughs> goggles, like I, and but the, I hadn't heard of the oral stuff. But I I'm currently on this new drop, uh, but um, then it, there's this you know possible glaucoma that comes out of it. But uh, this new one called Toberdex. ST suspension, which okay. um, they just started on me, and he doesn't know. I can only be on it for six days, so because it's a um, yeah. Steroid. Well, yeah, I will tell you that it does sound like your ophthalmologists are really on the ball and and know about all the options, and so um, you know, see see what else they can come up with in terms of of other you know treatment okay. things. I just didn't know if there was anything really new on the horizon. Yeah, there are other clinical trials out there, um, but you know, again, they would they would probably know about those options. But there are other, you know, it's, it's I've been impressed with um, how many clinical trials I've seen coming out for this this particular um, area. So, okay, all right, thank you so much. And I, I wrote you. down the pilocarpaline or carpine, and uh, maybe those are things to look into as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We're going to try thank to get to again. another question now, but thank you. Okay, Hannah, can you give us our next caller, please? Yes, and we'll go to our next question. Uh, yes, my name is Mike. I had a stem cell transplant uh, one year, five months ago. I did uh, great the first 100 days. Six months after my transplant, I had a growing number of issues. They said, well, it's probably graft host disease, put me on high dose steroids for four and a half months. Uh, and then they tapered me off and some of my, uh, symptoms came back. However, my doctor said, I don't really think you ever had graft host disease. Um, it, because it started six months later and then, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure for whatever other reasons. Um, but I, uh, I have no appetite and I'm losing tons of weight. And uh, I guess my first question would be, 
is it reasonable that six months after a transplant, if you had no symptoms previously, uh, would you, could you develop chronic if you didn't have any acute? Um, and is it still reasonable this this uh, year and five months later I'd still be having graft host disease uh, in my gut? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think that's also a common thing that we see. So the, for the first question, um, it is possible um, to have had no prior graft versus host disease and then develop it six months later. That's actually probably – it's a very common time to develop it, usually – most, not all, but um, a lot of the, the chronic GBHD we see will happen within the first year. Um, and it, it, even though the risk is higher, if you've had previous acute graft versus host disease, it's still possible to develop it that late. I mean, we see people even who develop it even later than that. So um, it okay. is still possible. And then in terms of the gut, um, you know, unfortunately, that is also something that we see with GVHD of the gut where people, you know, really just cannot keep weight on, um, whether they're eating or not, actually. And so, um, you know, if if there's – if it's an appetite issue, there's, there's ways to address the appetite specifically, but um, if you feel like you're eating and it's just not – you're not – Either you're not tolerating yeah. it, it's giving you digestion, things like that, or you're yeah, not, not able to. I'm not eating. Yeah, I'm not eating because of an appetite issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's where you know. Um, I mean, you could do a couple of things. I mean, there's there's some um, steroids that actually help coat the the kind of gut the gut itself. Things like Entacort. Um, other kinds of topical steroids that that sometimes can help with that a little bit. Um, and steroids, just in general, uh, steroid. I mean, steroids themselves help increase appetite. So a short course of like systemic steroids is also a possibility. Um, but the, you know, then there's also like just specific appetite stimulants if you think that it's it's an appetite issue. Um, yeah. You know, uh, and, and there are various forms of that, um, including Marinol, which is one that's sort of it's like related to um, marijuana. Um, marijuana itself, um, now that it's available in a lot of places uh, for medical purposes, um, but even other types of isn't forms it just of steroids. A, isn't that just THC that uh, right, correct, yeah. or is it also C? BD okay. or THC or things like that. Yeah, um, that sometimes can help people. Uh, and then there's other there's other um, steroid based uh, appetite stimulants um, that you could talk to your doctor about. But if you think it's an appetite issue, there's ways to address that. But even with appetite, sometimes people will eat, um, but it's just not absorbed well, or weight is hard to keep on. And that's where either the systemic treatments, like either systemic steroids or other treatments for graft versus host disease, or you know sometimes topical steroids can help uh, in the gut. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take our next caller, please. Yes, and caller, your line is now open. Hi, my name is Marlene. Um, I was diagnosed with AML back in November of 2016. Um, I had a bone marrow transplant in March of 2017. And um, I've been dealing with different issues with chronic GHD from my eyes to my skin, my mouth. Pretty much every single one has taken its uh, turn on me. Um, right now, my only question is, uh, I was told that my hair growth, um, it hasn't grown back since chemo, and it could be related to um, my hair follicles having GVHD. Do you have anything on that that I should, maybe something I could be using, topical, um, uh, maybe a cream, I don't know. Right now, I'm actually using some Monet products. I'm sure some of you are aware of what that is, but um, that's all I've, I'm pretty much using right now. I don't. I've tried different things, but nothing has worked. May I ask what you've tried? Like, have you tried, um, like, any uh, any topical treatments? Um, so I everything's been natural that I've been trying. Um, I've used, like, oil, different oils on my hair. Um, I haven't done, like, anything uh, medicated on my head, though. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have. I am not aware of any treatments specifically that help with the the hair loss. It sounds like it probably is from GVHD. Um, uh, honestly, I'm just not aware of treatments. I, I mean, for GVHD of the skin, we often do topical treatments um, since there are so many nice options. 
topical steroids, topical immunosuppressants. Um, there's light therapies and, and things like that. Um, I'm just not aware of any of those that specifically help with the hair growth, unfortunately. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I don't. Has, Meredith, have you ever heard of, of things working for people? I I haven't. No. Um, the only thing that I can think, and this is, I mean, it's more about maintaining the hair that you have, but using um, like the Aveda and Vachi products or something like that, but not as far as regrowth. No, I haven't. I'm sorry. No problem. Thank you. I'll look into it. Do we have another caller, Hannah? Yes, we'll go to our next question. Yes, my name is Patricia Fife. I had AML. I had a bone marrow transplant um, 11 months ago on August 14th using my sister's cell, my sister's um, stem cells, um, and we were a 10 match. And I was fine. I did fine. I feel fine in everything. But about two months ago, my liver enzymes started to go up, up, up at my bilirubin. And apparently, <clears throat> it's scrap versus host of the liver. So I wondered if you could comment on that. I'm on prednisone now. We're tapering it and tacolimus, and they're beginning to go down. <laughs> Sure, yeah. Thank you for that question. That is um, that is something that we see um, where sometimes you can just have isolated GBHD of the liver. Um, and fortunately, as in your case, it usually doesn't cause specific symptoms. Um, and it sounds like the treatment is very appropriate. Typically what we would do is treat with steroids and then some what we call steroid-sparing drug um, to be able to taper the steroids and then have something else there um, to maintain that response for a while and then eventually try to taper that off as well. Um, and if the um, if the liver function tests are improving, then we know that that was probably from, from graft-versus-host disease. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. And caller, your line is now open. All right. Sounds like my line is open. Uh, hey, my wife is going through treatment for graft versus host. She had a, uh, bone, a stem cell transplant about two years back um, for AML, and um, we're right now on photophoresis. So she's been going through that treatment for about the last three months or so. Uh, so down to like every other week that she's in there for for two treatments with that. Uh, but it's going slow. Um, not major progress or anything else. She has graft versus host of uh, her mouth, her eyes, um, some of the treatments that you talked about definitely for the eyes have really been working out well for her. Um, also skin, uh, some muscles, some joint pain that maybe is part of some osteoporosis or um, uh, also some residual cancer um, that's still kind of hanging out her joints. Um, but they're looking for some additional options. And one of the things they've recommended recently is, uh, I think it's rituximab for a an infusion. Is that one of those like like the Jack or Rock or you know, B-cell inhibitors? Um, she's really concerned with some of the potential side effects of it. Can you give any kind of feedback on rituximab, um, some of the, the benefits, drawbacks, um, and uh, how that works out? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, rituximab is um, a it's an anti B cell drug, um, and it's it's been around a very long time. We use it um, in almost every single B cell cancer that there is, uh, that or some form of other um, similar drug. Um, and because it does it you know it inhibit B cells, that's why it helps with chronic GBHD. And we've seen some good responses from that. That was actually looked at. Um, Fairly early, um, when there were when we people have been looking at B cell drugs, um, because it was one of the first, um, and you know the response rates are really good. You know, in the, in various studies, you know they quote response rates between forty to sixty percent um, around there, um, and again in folks who have not responded to other treatments, um, I would say so. Definitely, I think it's a good option. I would say that um, the side effects are, um, aside from the infusion reaction, are, are pretty minimal. Um, so the way the rituximab works is it's a what's called a, a monoclonal antibody. So it's a form of immunotherapy. It's basically an antibody that is targeting a protein on the B cells, and then the immune system takes it away. 
Um, and because it's an antibody, it, there's a risk of in, what, these, these infusion reactions um, that only really are a problem at the time of the infusion. Things like fevers, chills, you know, you can get blood pressure issues, you know, um, I would say fevers and shakes are probably the, the most common. Um, so um, we, you know, standardly give a pre-medication to try, pre-medications to try to, to um, prevent that. And even when they happen, because they're so common, uh, we're pretty good at treating them, and it's usually not to any point where people would need to stop treatment or, um, you know, or, or to the point where it gets very serious, um, only because we've, we've become really good at, at treating them and, and being on top of it. Um, so, and then other than that, um, you know, again, side effects that, that she would feel would be pretty minimal. So um, I think it's actually a really good option. The the infusion reactions probably sound scary, but again, because we're so ready for them and, and prepared um, and good at treating them, um, usually they're um, very manageable. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Can we have our next caller, please? Yes, and call your line is now open. Hi there, my name is Kathy, and I've got a couple quick questions, if that's okay. I am was on Jack V. Uh, I had my stem cell transplant about four and a half years ago, and I have GVHD of the eyes and mouth, the lung, the liver, the skin, the subcutaneous tissue, the down below, all that kind of thing. And I've been on Jack V, along with prednisone and serolimus, and my hemoglobin recently dropped from, it was like in the mid 9.5 kind of thing, to 6.4. I did have two units of uh, a transfusion with blood cells and feel better, but, um, and I've stopped the jack of these, and I'm wondering if I was on, uh, five milligrams twice a day because I'm on posiponazole, so I was on a fairly low dose as a posiponazole. If I were to stop it and, um, start again, is it likely that I'll have the anemia happen again? Is it safe to start it again? How long would I wait before I start it again? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I'm glad you, there's somebody on the line who's had experience with, with Jacophy. Um, yeah, uh, anemia is a common um, side effect. Um, you know, uh, it, it's it, it's tough because it's something that is certainly manageable. We can give transfusions for that, but that's not something that we want to have happen or do long term. Um, it, you you are in a low dose. I mean, you you could potentially go down even lower to just five milligrams once a day. Um, although ideally it is a twice a day drug. Um, if you stop it and start it again, I mean, it's it's possible the anemia could come back. It might not, but um, so it's worth a try. But it, it, it's possible it still would come back. Um, but you would you would only need to really hold it until you see that your um, the anemia has stabilized. Um, mm-hmm. I'll also say that, um, well, two things. One, that you want to be careful about, um, you know, the the effects, you know, not, we don't see this in GBHD so much, but, you know, when we stop myelofibrosis, it, it stop Jacophy in myelofibrosis abruptly, um, you can have sort of a rebound effect where you start to feel worse pretty, pretty quickly because there's, you know, sort of just this reactive process to stopping it so quickly. Um, which we don't really think in GBH, which is something to think about. And then the other thing is to also be sure that, you know, if you're going to blame it on the jack, if you make sure that's what it is and make sure there's no other, mm-hmm. make sure you've about any other causes that are unrelated um, mm-hmm. so that you're not you're not just thinking it's just the jack. It, it certainly could be because that's a common side effect, but just make, just to also not forget about other, other things. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I check to make sure there's not another reason. Okay, that, that's very helpful. And another quick question is with regards to lung transplantation. Um, at what point do you consider people, um, suggest to people that they should go for a lung transplant consult, at least they're for lung transplantation? And is it better to do it when they're a little bit more healthy and maybe better able to withstand the procedure, or do you wait until their FEV1 is, like, really, really low and it's, you know, quite sick and then do it at that? point thinking that you don't want to do it too early just in case maybe they don't get worse um uh, but if you did it earlier they might be healthier and better able to survive just uh i'm wondering your thoughts on that 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, or I, I think it's always good to have um, at least an evaluation um, if you're getting to the point where, you know, other systemic options are not helping or they're not, they're not options remaining um, and, and you are seeing a progression. Um, it's, uh, you know, we're fortunate here in Pittsburgh because we have a great lung transplant team um, and so I feel very confident in sort of getting people referrals, um, you know, when, when I think it's appropriate. But um, I will say that um, you wouldn't be able to – so, you know, the way that the lung transplant works is you you are prioritized by how severe the lung disease is. Um, and so people with more severe lung disease are obviously higher on the list and, and, and we get the transplant sooner. Um, and the doctors on those teams are usually pretty good at saying, you know, now is not the right time to be listed versus, yes, this is pretty serious, you should be listed uh, now. Um, and some of those things do are, are related to FEV1, um, very, very strongly related to any need for oxygen. So if someone's on oxygen, that bumps them up pretty highly. And that's definitely, for me, that's definitely a, a tipping point to, okay, well, we should at least, you know, get an evaluation. Evaluation, um, because you're right. I mean, if you're, if you know, if it's earlier on in the disease course, it may not get worse. And you know, it, it uh, something like a lung transplant is not necessarily um, indicated. Um, but also, just you know, to reassure you that if it's, you know, I wouldn't think of it as like sort of being too late or you know, someone's too sick because um, lung transplants are done in people who obviously have very severe lung disease. So by nature, um, people are pretty deconditioned, you know, not able to do a lot of things on their own, um, you know, normal activities, things like that. Um, and so that's that's not necessarily a predictor of how well people will do if, if the reason for those things is because of the lungs. Um, so typically, you know, again, like oxygen requirements, things like that are sort of a tipping point or if it's just really worsening, without any um, anything helping. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. And last quick question. You had mentioned, I think, was it earlier in your talk, an um, elastase inhibitor that's being studied? Was it an elastase inhibitor or something like that for lungs? Yes. Or is it an antipsychotic? Or? It's called a neutrophil elastase inhibitor. It's basically... Um, inhibits an enzyme in neutrophils that makes them, makes neutrophils sort of activated. And, you know, what neutrophils normally do is they um, attack um, pathogens, you know, like bacteria, infections, things in the lungs that are not supposed to be there. So that's that's the good job that they have is they clear away infections and, and other things like that. Um, but when it gets sort of overly activated, they can then, instead of getting rid of bacteria, they can damage lung tissue. Um, and so this basically inhibits the enzyme that, that can cause some of that damage when the neutrophils are overactive in that process. So um, that, that's how they work. And so it's, it's really a very specific drug that is only being looked at in certain lung diseases and then, of course, lung GVHD. Um, the study um, was open at the NIH, and then we should be hopefully developing a, a follow-up study um, fairly soon with that drug. So it's not for it. So it's still in the study phase. It's not available. Um, no, it's not available. It's not. Okay. And what is it called? It's like a neutral lactase inhibitor, but is there a specific name for the actual drug? Yes. Um, it is Al Aldestat. I have to look up the exact. I want to give you the right spelling, so if you give me just one moment. It is A L V L E S T A T. Oh, this that. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sorry to take up so much of the time, but you've been very, very helpful. I appreciate it. Sure, thanks for your questions. Thank you. We will take one last question, and then we're going to have to close. But again, people may submit their questions to me if they did not get answered today. Uh, one last caller, please, Hannah. Sure, we'll go to our last question. Is that me? That's Hello? you. Hello, oh, you hey. are on. This is Corey. Uh, <clears throat> I've had quite a few different GVHDs. It's been almost four years since my uh, transplants. I've had skin and mouth and 
Um, but my main question is, and lungs, I ended up with um, organizing pneumonia and almost no platelets, so ended up in ICU. So some things I don't know whether they're related to the severe myopathy I had or neuropathy from other uh, from the chemos. Uh, but one strange item that no one's ever really been able to put their finger on is and it's pretty much my last lingering GVHD is I have horrible constipation. If I don't take Miralax twice a day, I'm just a mess. Not a mess. Lack of mess. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Hello? Oh, yeah, I'm here. Dr. M. Um, yeah, the the GI manifestations of GVHD can be broad. broad. So people, I think, typically think of diarrhea, but you're right, constipation or lack of um, movement can be an issue as well. That's sort of um, a problem with the, um, you know, the GI tract normally moves and kind of contracts and does things like that to, to move things along. And so this is like a problem with like the lack of that movement. Um, that can be sort of just from... Um, you know, the, the GI tract itself. And, so, and occasionally it can actually even be from something we call neuropathy. Uh, we think of neuropathy as like the, from, you know, related to the nerves in our uh, extremities and things like that. But it actually, you know, the nerves that connect your GI tract, that can be, that can be an issue um, as well with the nerves there that sort of signal the GI tract to move. Um, uh, fortunately, it sounds like if, if, Stool softeners work for you. That's great. Um, the, another thing that sometimes can help people are just what we call motility drugs that are just help the GI tract move again. Um, that's always a, 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 an option. Things like Reglan, although I will say that Reglan has can have some side effects as well, um, or uh, even stronger like laxatives and things like that. But if if the Miralax is working for you, that's 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 great because that's a really easy and, and pretty harmless uh, uh, treatment. I would say I was never, like, constipated. It just got so, I don't know, large. I mean, I ended up with hemorrhoids now and other problems I didn't have before. So now if I just miss a dose just by accident, you know, it's just it causes more problems. I see, yeah. So I was just, I was just surprised because I hadn't really heard of that before, and I didn't know if there maybe there was something else going on, but apparently not, and... For those that are listening, I had eye problems for for quite a few years and was just getting ready to get plugs in, and now I'm lucky if I put eye drops in every couple of days now. So, can you, can you share with us what helped? Um, I it was, I think it just took it just took time. Um, it was sometimes just horrible. I mean, I couldn't. I couldn't do anything but just keep my eyes closed, and sometimes that wasn't even good enough. I could put eye drops in every 15 minutes, and, that, and you know, that would not help. Um, and it just slowly resolved itself, it seems like. Yeah, that, that's great. I actually, I'm glad you brought that point, and thank you for saying that, because um, two last things that I, I that I, I want to say in closing, if that's okay. One that, you know, I, I think that's a great example of that sometimes it just takes time Um and, and we see that a lot, and it and it's it's you know it's hard when you're going through it because it feels like forever, and it feels like it's gonna be forever, and it feels like you know I mean how how can you wait that out? But you know a lot of these some of these things can certainly um, just resolve with with time. You just have to give it that time. Um, and then um, the other thing that I'll say with eyes that I, I didn't mention before, but that because I was talking about topical stuff, but um, you know the 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 systemic therapy that I've seen a lot of anecdotally have seen a lot of good experience with is this new KDO25 ROC2 inhibitor, um, and so it's been interesting because you know we, as I said earlier we don't typically think of the eyes as being something that's really sensitive to systemic treatments, but this has been really impressive to see some results with this. So again, I, I'm hopeful that this drug will be FDA approved um, in the not too far distant future. So um, you know, we can all all um, be hopeful for that. Great, thank you so much, Dr. M. Thank you, Meredith, and and thank you all for these questions. And and certainly our last caller, that was a great a great reminder that this doesn't have to be forever. 
Um, everyone can stay tuned. We're going to have another Lunch and Learn next month, August 19th. Um, we will have Dr. DeWolf from Memorial Sloan Kettering speaking about COVID uh, care in cancer patients, and she will also have a cancer patient present uh, who survived it. And so um, keep posted for that information coming. As a reminder, if you have additional questions, you can go on mbmtlink.org and submit them to myself, Jennifer Gillette, the social worker, and uh, as well as there's, if there's any other ways that we can support you, feel free to call us at 1-800-L-I-N-K-B-N-T. So thank you to our speakers, our sponsors, our link partners, and all for joining us today. We hope you were able to put another tool in your toolbox to help you with your fight against chronic graft-versus-host disease. Have a great day. Bye-bye.